Hello, so it's me again, Mathieu. Uh, now the second topic I have for today is about restartable sequences. So I'll start with some good news. Uh, whereas uh, with what I'm bringing, uh, that's covered by the talk I gave on Monday, containers get something for free, which is great. And then I want to discuss how I can do uh, that over shared memory within containers. So bear with me. Uh, just a quick uh, explanation of what restartable sequence is and allows doing. So uh, it's a system call that I uh, uh, pushed into the Linux kernel, commented to the Linux kernel. Um, it registers a per thread area. So user space registers a per thread area, and that's Glibcy doing it since version 2.35. It allows user space to create small, let's say, transactions, which are managed by the kernel. Uh, and those uh, transactions allow fast access to per CPU data in user space. Uh, Glibc is making use of it to speed up its own sked get CPU because uh, our, the per thread area can keep around the current CPU uh, ID number. So uh, rather than going uh, calling a VDSO, it's actually much cheaper to just do a load. So Glibc does that. Uh, and uh, on architectures like uh, ARM64, where SCAD get CPU, um, well, the get CPU uh, VDSO was not implemented. I mean, that's a, so skipping a system call and doing a load instead is extremely interesting. Uh, there are use cases, uh, major use cases for this. Uh, one of those is memory allocators. TC Malloc is uh, a user of the restartable sequence. Uh, my user space tracer and counter uh, uh, tracking that's coming, also that last one, uh, within LTTNG. Uh, uh, I want to make use of that. However, there are concerns about container and memory. So the problem statement. So in a large multi-core system, let's say you have a 256 core system that's par partitioned as many containers using CPU sets. Uh, Having uh, user space allocate per CPU data structures is extremely wasteful in terms of memory. I mean, if you take number of possible CPUs that the kernel knows about, and that's actually what the container is observing, that's going to be 256. And even if it's in a CPU set, that can only be, a, be, be running on, let's say, max of uh, four cores. So the, um, of course, RSEC, Critical sections use per CPU data structures in user space. So we want per CPU data, uh, but we also want to min minimize memory allocation uh, when there is little concurrency for threads touching the data structure. Um, and uh, so we ideally we want to allocate user space per CPU, per CPU data. Uh, with number of entries being a mi minimum between the number of concurrent threads that can touch that data the SCAD affinity and the CPU set. And it's also, of course, limited by the number of online CPUs. So uh, more details, uh, if you want more details about the, the RSEC per memory space um, virtual CPU ID, uh, I, I recommend that you uh, go and see my talk, that I, the talk I gave on Monday in the referee track. Uh, but a quick problem summary. So this is really the per process part. So let's say you have a memory allocator. Your uh, free lists, uh, so your memory arenas, are local to your process. So it's a private data structure. Um, you would like to have that as uh, per core free lists, but in a container it can be extremely wasteful for memory, especially with CPU sets used. So, um, so for the for this case, uh, I'm extending RSEC with a new field MMVCPUID that's going to be exposed. Uh, so um, that allows basically using. Uh, so so we use the scheduler knowledge about the level of concurrency within a process to limit those values. So that that's what it does in a nutshell. And I do this per memory space, so per process. Um, and all is good, and it's going to improve uh, container workloads whenever the memory allocator is using 
this feature to keep its memory arenas. So that's all great, all well. The uh, one thing I want to bring up is about checkpoint restore here. So the notion of uh, having a, 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 well, extreme maximum of possible number of CPUs, let's say you want to have an array of how many, what's the worst case, right? You can usually query the kernel about the number of uh, possible configured uh, CPUs. This should not go beyond that. Uh, that can be useful. I mean, if, if your user space code cannot, does not plan to extend beyond this initial size, that, that's useful. Uh, and, and then it could, let's say, well, keep, keep null pointers for all that and do lazy allocation whenever there's actually use of those, of those entries, of those uh, indexes. But uh, for CRIU, when you're checkpointing on a kernel and then you're restored on a different kernel, that number of uh, maximum number of possible CPU might be completely different. So that's an op open question to you guys. How do you think we should manage that? I mean, there are many ways to do this. Either we lie to user space, either we add some extra affinity limits constraint to make the system appear as having fewer CPUs than it has. I don't know. That's that's actually an open question. I mean, if there's like one way you could treat that is effectively as another effectively property of the CPU. Can I, like you need to already match the CPU extensions and flags between systems because you don't want to restore on like an earlier generation of a CPU effectively. It feels like this might kind of fit in the same bucket, but like you don't want to restore on a target system that has less possible CPUs than the source one, maybe? Well, having less will work. It's having more that's uh, a problem. Right, true, yeah. yeah that so so yeah, it yeah. does not kind of evolve well. That's the thing. Uh, can we use C groups to limit the number of CPUs? Yeah, I guess. I mean, you could artificially limit, uh, I mean, with CPU sets. C group CPU set could be a way. You, so you limit the restored process to a subset of the available uh, cores. That, that think, could solve it. Yeah, I, think, I think the main catch there is that if you don't necessarily know whether the task you've checkpointed made use of that or not. So yeah. you effectively need to always capture at, at um, checkpoint time what what things was like on that source system. So you can then decide what to do in the restore because you can't tell whether a given task is actually actively using that or not. Yeah. 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 We can we can save the number of CPUs on the source host. Yeah. And actually we already dump uh, properties of CPU C groups and this can yeah. help us. Yeah. What you want is to uh, save your uh, uh, SCAD affinity mask, your CPU set that can be applied, and as well have some information about your uh, maximum number of possible CPUs when you checkpoint. And then when you restore, so let's say your, maxim your number of possible CPU extends beyond that, then you could, well, I mean, you use the other properties and then you use the right masking to, to reduce that to what the old system could present to user space. So that could be done. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, yeah. So, so uh, moving on. So uh, here's the problem I have. I, so it's all nice, this per process private data thing uh, with virtual CPU IDs for memory allocators, but I'm doing a tracer. And that tracer has a, uh, makes extensive use of uh, shared memory. So I want to be able to use that shared memory within a container without wasting too much memory. Because currently I use max number of possible CPU and I allocate memory for all that. So it's extremely bad in a partitioned scenario because I'm wasting tons of memory. So uh, in order to extend that, uh, okay, so, so that's a summary about what happens in the root namespace. I mean, yeah, basically I, I use max, uh, and the number of possible CPUs, um, I use get get CPU to index through it, and that's pretty much it. But in a uh, PID namespace or C group CPU set, so the typical case is to use uh, the CPU sets to restrict a PID namespace to a subset of CPUs on the system. Uh, so as I understand it, you can specify a target number of CPUs, and then it can burst and and kind of use CPU outside of that. Uh, 
Uh, and there's also a mode where you can really partition. So you delegate a partition of uh, the, the, the mask of CPUs. So, uh, and this is the, 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 the domain CPU sets. There's also threaded CPU sets. When you say burst, do you mean go above the set limits? Is that what you mean? Sorry? When you said target number with burst, you just said it can go above that. Do you mean uh, it can go above, if you say CPU set equals four or yep. whatever, four CPUs? Are you saying that you think it can go above four CPUs being used? Yes, there are. I mean, if you don't use the partitioning mode of CPU set, if you just specify, oh yeah, go for four, uh, uh, if the resources of the system are not used by other containers, you can get more than that. I didn't know that. We'll have to go double check. I mean, you guys are the expert. I read. I, I would say that's not possible, yeah. but I mean. I know that's true for CPU shares. I didn't think it was true for CPU sets. No, I would think not. I, I think that the, the way it works is that. Uh... Because it, it, it's, a, it's restricting the scheduler as to what, yeah, what CPU ID exactly, yeah. it can schedule on. So that shouldn't be possible. It is true for shares. Like if you give an amount of effectively like a like share of, of, of uh, scheduling time, then those will be, that is a, a under load, it will be applied, but not otherwise. But I believe that for the CPU set pinning, it does. I actually can't even target number. I know LX, LXD can, because it does it automatically, but, but you can't target number with like the actual system, uh, with the actual API. You just set what CPUs you can use. You can't say, give me any four CPUs, right? Correct. Yeah, so you can only partition with, with the kernel API. Yeah, the kernel API is, gets you like a yeah, CPU set mask of like 0, 0,1, uh, 0, 0,2, 2, yeah, 4, yeah, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, uh, but like container okay. runtimes hide this. Like yeah. LXD will like, you can say, give me 4, right. and I'll give you something. LXD, you can just give me 4. LXD will then internally look at all of the other containers it has and figure out what the pinning is and then write the specific pin. Yeah, into but, the but the actual kernel API is all partitioning. Okay, I'll have to go back, read the okay, documentation yeah, yeah. about this speci uh, specific detail. Okay, let's continue that offline, but good point. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, getting the max uh, maximum or mask for possible vCPUs uh, for max size allocation is uh, one one of the problem we face, and uh, having a getter for the maximum. Okay, so maximum number of possible vCPUs. Well, I could use the, the the number of possible CPUs on the system, right? I just want to have an array of null pointers basically, so I don't mind. But then I, I getting a, a, a mask of online vCPUs for pre-allocation, so I could consider get, using the SCAD affinity or CPU set mask to actually have some idea, of, okay, I need to pre-allocate real memory for all those entries, so that's fine. Uh, so the, re the real, and that's really, I think it's my last slide. Uh, slide. This is really the question part. So, okay. So this is really a resortable sequence vCPU ID allocation domain that would allow uh, me to you have shared memory, use across processes within a container, but then where do I put that? I mean, I have a bitmap that the scheduler needs to keep track of to basically make sure that those virtual CPU IDs do not get used by two threads from that container at the same time, because then they would be uh, uh, touching concurrently the same per CPU data, and it's a no-go. I mean, that, that's a guarantee that I need to provide. So, but this, this bit, bitmap, where do I put it? Should, I, should we put it in a PID namespace, user na namespace, C group CPU set, create a new namespace for that, and whether it needs to be hierarchical, which I don't think makes sense for this case. I think, I mean, Having that hierarchical means you need to go up to the root, so you end up being kind of constrained in sharing with the root everything, which makes no real sense. So I think within a namespace, having the ability to have access to this, this notion of a shared vCPU ID allocation domain makes sense. But yeah, I, I just don't know where to put it. My, my, my good feeling, and we'll see if Alexa agrees, uh, is that it should probably belong to the same spot that's got the limit. Therefore, C group CPU set would probably be the. Because you don't, like, you can totally apply um, CPU set rules to, like, a random set of processes that are not even part of the same PID namespace. Yeah. Um, you can totally do that. I mean, the, the, C, the, the, the C group CPU set already takes, like, echo a number of, like, 
of threads to it, the thread IDs to it, and it, they will be in that C group. Yeah, and this uh, the uh, CPU uh, set C group can be threaded, right? Yes, so yeah, it's one of the threaded ones. Yeah, so you can even have you could have a process that that has half of its threads in that C group and half of the other threads in another C group. Yeah. Um, the problem I see. So so you're saying put that within the C group CPU set. Effectively, right? yeah, because yeah, you, but the you, problem you, is, let's say I have a container which uh, with a shared memory. I have tons of processes interacting on that shared memory. And let's say you have a few of those processes which gets into a a a, a, a sub CPU set, right? They get further limited. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be okay for them to still interact in that shared memory. But if we make this bitmap of of allocation in, uh, if we put it in the CPU set, their current CPU set is now not the same anymore, and they cannot touch the shared memory anymore. It seems odd. But is it the? Uh, um... The thing is, I'm not, sure if, I'm not sure if putting a namespace would help you. I was going to say that the, the namespace that immediately comes to mind is the IPC one, since the IPC one is for the system V IPC stuff. I mean, it's not. this is not IPC in that respect, but it was the first thing that came to mind. Yeah. So mm -hmm. There is a namespace that does that. But, okay, yes. Uh, I was thinking, like, yeah, what do we do for shared memory? It's like, well, the IPC namespace would be kind of the go-to for that. Um, yeah, but the thing is... But it would, it would still be a relation of the two. It's like IPC combined with CPU sets in one... In, yeah. in some way. Well, but well, in some way, what I want to do is IPC over shared memory, right? Yeah. If, if we if we just take by definition, right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, requiring people to well, I mean, in terms of documentation, okay. If you want to your processes to do IPC over a shared memory file, please make sure that they are in the same IPC namespace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's already the case for system base, uh, system, uh, system five stuff, right? already need that anyway yeah, yeah but i was gonna say that i mean yeah the, the thing is is that uh, it's um uh i, I guess the point is, is that it, the in the case that you you did not do this thing uh where you now have this other process which was which has access to shared memory but now has a different cpu set or whatever else and they can't touch touch it that is uh that is like the fault of the program that, that did that right so effectively if we if we can make a way for them to opt into this that's actually what you want it's not that it's not you're worried about some security attack or something like that it's purely that you want this process to be able to opt into saying from scratch i want to set up these uh, rsec things again this this shared memory well that would be kind of an attribute associated with the cpu set create a new cpu a, a child cpu set that belongs to a different vcp uh, vcpu id allocation domain All right. so that could be opt in as we say but uh, I don't know. I, I kind of like the simplicity about uh, documenting. Oh, please share the IPC namespace. And right. That's I it. mean, for, for containers, we already do that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. IPC then. Yeah. Um, IPC is not hierarchical, hierarchical though, right? No. Uh, it is not. It's no. Not. It's, it it's, it's, no, but that it's okay. I don't want it to be hierarchical. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because I mean, thinking about it a little bit, it does not really make sense. To, I mean, you 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 want to have one ID that you will use to index something in an array, right? If it's hierarchical, what does it mean to have the parent of the parent of the parent being able to use that shared memory? It means that the root namespace needs to share that exact same bitmap. And then you're back to not being able to take advantage of any of what this brings. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, whether or not you get, how you'll tie together IPC and C group, that'll be a different topic. But I mean, I, I would say that in theory, that to me, that would make the most sense, depending on obviously how it actually shakes out when you go implement it. It's going to be kind of funny because like the actual the actual limit, which is on the CPU set side, is hierarchical ish. I mean, it's one of the the, the CPU set thing is not absolutely ish. terrible for this mess. But not yeah. ish. It's kind of it's kind of that's the whole point of C group V two, right? It's strictly hierarchical. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just remember the nightmare of like the the, the I think C group two still has the issue. C group one was particularly bad. Well, like if you've got a child process um, that's like in a particular CPU set, and you go and change the CPU set of the parent, then all hell breaks loose because you can't, you because can't that fix. can't propagate and doesn't know what to do with the child C, CPU sets, and it just I gets really wonky. I don't think that happens since. C group two, though. I don't remember what it does in C group two. So I know it, group, it just fails in C group one. Like in C group one, if you try to modify it the parent, it just changes fails. down if there are any active users of a given CPU. So if you want to remove a CPU, but in any child C group, there is still a CPU set that contains that CPU, then you can't. And if you add a CPU, 
I don't know if it even yeah. propagates. It might propagate, but it, I got, CPU yeah. said two in uh, uh, C group yeah. two. CPU said uh, uh, has solved it. Yeah. Because I, yeah. I remember, I remember like writing some logic for for Alexei. We didn't actually implement, but I wrote the logic for it. Which was like, if we want to do this safely in C group one, we need to like freeze the container, go in all the child C groups, allow them to do both the current stuff and the new stuff we want. Um, then go in the parent and restrict parent, like remove the uh, effectively no, we need to bump the parents to allow both existing and new, yeah. propagate that through and then shrink things yeah. back uh, the, the, the yeah. way back down. Like ah. The nice thing about this mechanism that I'm presenting is that it's completely independent of the the, the, the technology that applies the constraints. Mm -hmm. So you can use sked set affinity. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the scheduler that observes how much concurrency there is for the group and it allocates the bits yeah. that's it uh, I, I want to ask uh, about adding what happens if because uh, you can add um, to a running process you can add it you can give it a new CPU it can run on during one time I mean if, if it's in, if it's in a leaf right obviously yeah. but um because you were saying earlier that you have the check or restore issue where if you restore onto a thing there's different numbers of total CPUs the same thing would apply on like a running process where you can add a CPU right? Can you repeat that? Sorry, so because like in a C group, if you're running a process in a C group and it has already it's already set up, you can just add a new CPU to its CPU set, uh, effectively, and the process uh, does not know by itself. I mean, I guess there probably is a thing it could pull to get that information, but um, most processes would not would not know that that has changed. Yep. Um, so, so the thing is, you pre-allocate the max uh, configured CPU oh, for the whole the, system, uh, right? Okay, okay, okay. The, that's the null pointers. And then you need to lazy allocate on first use. All of... right, this is the lazy allocation thing. Yeah, yeah sorry. So, yeah, okay, right. Yeah. So it's not a problem. Yeah, okay. Okay. Hey, that's a, a good question. Sorry, this is a side, but uh, is cgroup.cpu set pollable? Yeah. I mean, cgroup does have polling stuff like built in. Yeah, yeah, and it's a lot of course, cgroup stat and all that kind yeah, of stuff. That I don't would know. be all populated. I think you can poll. It would be interesting if you could poll the CPU. I can take a look later, but yeah, yeah that's a different topic. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. All right, so that's all I have actually. So uh, if you want to uh, have the early lunch, you have two minutes. Well, no, we still have one more talk because lunch is at uh, half past. So yeah, we've got. Oh, one there's more. another talk. Right? We've got one more remote talk and then it's lunch. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.